Hi, I'm Brenna Quirk. I'm an online course developer here at InterSystems. Today I'm going to be talking to one of our sales engineers, Elijah Cotterell, um, about setting up your development environment for developing generative AI applications, uh, specifically setting up a RAG application. So Elijah, would you mind giving me a quick refresher on what a RAG application is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, RAG is this fairly interesting concept where you assume you've got a pre-trained a uh, generative AI model, for example, uh, a large language model provided by either open source or maybe you're using one of the GPT models. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how can you effectively use your own data to modify the outputs of the language model itself? So typically training a model takes a lot of time. It's very uh, resource intensive. So being able to efficiently use uh, your data in context um, is sort of a pretty big deal when you're actually uh, operationalizing some of this uh, technology. Mm -hmm. So to give you an example, uh, if you wanted to implement RAG, what you might do is integrate an existing database or integrate some existing documents that you have into your uh, generative AI application right. mm -hmm. and provide these directly to the language model. Um, that, that's sort of a very sort of high level overview. Uh, it, the technology can go sort of all much, much deeper than that. You can uh, design very complex RAG applications with all sorts of uh, retrieval methods and, and usage of AI. But from a high level overview, that's that's pretty much it. Okay, great. Um, so we're getting set up in our development environment. Where do we start? Yeah, so that's, that's a big question. And first thing to point out is most of your development when you're building a RAG application will be in Python. Python is just the language of choice for the majority of uh, AI development at the moment, particularly building AI applications. Um, so what you'll first need is an IDE that's compatible with Python. Um, we're going to be using Visual Studio Code in this case, and I like VS Code because uh, mostly because of the extensions library. So it's got a huge uh, community involved that you know, build custom extensions for certain things. Mm -hmm. and if we look at this bar on the left over here, for example, uh, it's very easy to, to import certain things. So if I want to implement uh, a Jupyter Notebook over here, there's support for that. Yeah, if I want to containerize some applications, again, it can integrate directly with my container uh, environments or for the, the Docker engine. Um, but in this case, we're mostly going to be building in Python. So if you wanted to do this in PyCharm, for example, uh, that's absolutely fine. If you want to do it in Jupyter Labs, that would also work. Uh, it's really up to you. Okay, great. So so once we've picked our IDE and we're ready to start coding, what do we need to do next? Yep. So the next stage is defining an actual Python environment to start yeah. building in. Um, once you've got the IDE, um, typically you want to isolate your dependencies. So what I've actually got over here is just a breakdown of some of the packages that we'll be using. Um, and I've sort of labeled these because I think it's important to understand which libraries sort of do what. Mm -hmm. Um, so the basic requirements here, you know, we'll be using pandas for just some data manipulation. It's a very popular library. We'll also be using sentence transformers, which is a library provided uh, to run embedding models. That's how you convert text into what we call a vector. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are all vital for actually being able to interface with a large language model effectively, um, but also being able to run comparisons between your data. And then we've got a few other things. The data sets over here it gives you access to open source data provided on Hugging Face. OpenAI gives you access to OpenAI. Um, and then we've got some other packages here, uh, more for orchestration. So we'll talk more about how to actually design a RAG application um, a bit later. But for now, you know, you, you sort of keep in mind that there will be certain packages that are worth using to design an application, like Langchain or Llama Index. Uh, we'll be using Langchain uh, for, this, uh, for this course, though. And then a few other things uh, in case anyone's interested. Um, but to actually create the virtual environment to, to run these dependencies in, um, first thing we'll need to do is you'll want to initialize a uh, virtual environment over here. So that's what this uh, Python command does. Um, in this case, I've already actually created this in a directory called .venv, uh, which you can see on the left-hand side over here. Um, but once you do that, you can then uh, access the virtual environment with one of the scripts that it will have uh, initiated for you. 
So if I do dot then scripts and then activates, and then in VS Code you'll get this nice little sort of a, a green text over here to indicate that you're within the virtual environment. And at this point you can use the standard Python package installer. So what I'll do is uh, pip install minus r worms. And what this does uh, is using all of these uh, requirements defined in my text file, it's going to iteratively go through line by line, and it's going to install each of these. Uh, they should already be installed, so it should be pretty fast, but um, if you're doing this for the first time, it, it may take a while, particularly mm -hmm. for machine learning libraries that typically very large. Right. Um, but in this case, everything's already there, so we're okay. Great. Um, so you mentioned that we will need to integrate with a large language model. So how does that part work? Yes, that's, that's very interesting. Um, once you have your data being retrieved from your database or your documents, uh, the question is, how do you actually interface with the large language model, right? So there are a lot of different ways to do that, and it really depends on how you have actually deployed the, the model. So if you're using an existing service like OpenAI, um, typically all you have to worry about is making HTTP requests okay. to their server. They've already hosted their own endpoints, that's fine. If you've deployed your own model, uh, perhaps locally, maybe you're using an open model, um, then you may have to design your own web server to interface with that. Um, there are various services available, you know, hugging face endpoints, for example, you know, just to run inference against a web application, but that's something that you'll need to consider. Um, building an effective interface to your, your language model, bearing in mind it will need quite a lot of resources to run. Right. Um, so could you show us an example in, in the environment that you have set up? So I've got a few um, Jupyter notebooks over here. Let's see. Okay, I'll start with this one. So what I'll do is I'll just sort of go through a few steps over here. Um, the first thing we'll do is just import some of the packages that we'll need. And again, each of these dependencies have already been brought into the environment. It's just about uh, importing which uh, objects, which methods we actually want. Mm -hmm. So I'll just start by uh, importing these. And if we're using OpenAI, for example, um, again, they've got APIs built in to a lot of these packages. So we talked a little bit about Langchain as an orchestration tool. Langchain is actually a, it's a very versatile library um, that covers things like uh, integrations with third-party apps, like OpenAI, like Hugging Face. Um, but also conversational chains. So that means being able to keep track of uh, memory of the conversation that you've just had with the large language model. So being able to keep a record of every uh, message that's been passed back and forth uh, and being able to integrate that with other things. So one thing we'll do here is uh, we'll import the uh, community integration for OpenAI and we'll also import this uh, particular memory um, object. And the point of this is actually, rather than storing every message that's ever been sent between the AI and the user, what we can actually do is store a conversation, which is also generated by a language model. And you know there are a few benefits to that. It, it keeps the number of tokens way down, um, because rather than storing every single message, you can just store a much more succinct summary, because you still need to pass this back to the language model. Um, but yeah, that's just some of the things that we can consider. And then, over here, we can actually instantiate um, this uh, sort of connection object to our endpoint. And again, we can specify the model here, GPT 3.5. It's a very commonly used model for uh, text generation. And then you may want to define a function over here to count the number of tokens, but uh, we're not too interested in that. In this case, this shouldn't be a particularly uh, intensive application. And then over here, what we can do is we can actually define our, well, it's what we call a chain. So this is, you know, the, the construction for storing uh, all of the activity that's happened between the user and the AI. That's, that's ultimately what this chain is. And when I instantiate this, all it's done is it's used the large language model definition uh, from above, and it specified a memory object based on summary. And so the, the, the benefit really of using an orchestration tool like Langchain is it abstracts away a lot of the tedious stuff that you would have to deal with here. 
And what that means is, uh, sorry, it's actually printing the memory template over here. This is actually what it passes to the AI. So progressively summarize the lines of conversation provided, blah, blah, blah. It then gives an example of how you might summarize things. And, it, you know, really what it's doing is it's abstracting away some of the, I guess, prompting that you would typically have to do to get these results. Mm -hmm. But now if I actually ask the AI something directly, I say, tell me something about the weather in 2018. Might warn me about a package, that's okay. So currently there is no history because this is the first thing we've sent to the model. Right. And it says, you know, in 2018, significant weather events around the world, wildfires in California, for example. And now if I ask a second question, any uh, long lasting storms in 2018, first thing we'll see is actually, it has a history attached. So the human asks the AI, I didn't, I didn't choose this phrasing, that's, <laughs> that's what it comes with. Um, the AI explains that 2018 saw significant weather events, but then it gives us some additional information about hurricanes. Right. And then if I just say, well, what were we just talking about? Which really is sort of the litmus test of whether the memory works properly. We were discussing the weather events that occurred in 2018, including blah, blah, blah. So what it's done is it's very effectively retrieved the information that we've just used. It's created a summary using the same language model. Uh, so it's really making two calls at once. Um, but yeah, that's just sort of a, a very sort of a quick overview of how you might actually interface with a language model. Very cool. All right. Um, well, this was a, a pretty simple setup, so I'm excited to uh, look a little bit more at the actual, uh, at the application that we have set up a little bit later. Definitely. There's a, a yeah, as I said, this technology can go in pretty much any direction. There's a lot of depth uh, to really explore here. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting and quickly developing area of technology. So, you know, anything that we're seeing now would probably look quite different in six months, definitely even a couple of years. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting area to, to keep up with. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Elijah. Thanks.